Hey class, in this recording we are going to focus on exercise 10, the appendicular skeleton. In particular, we're going to focus on the upper limb in this recording. So as we look at our upper limb, let me go ahead and... Uh... Oh, here we go, here we go. Got a little click happy there. I'm going to go back to Visible Body, Anatomy Atlas, and here's our default view uh, of our full skeleton. And while I'm just looking at view number one of the skeletal system, I'm going to clean it up a bit because I don't like ligaments. Uh, there we go. Fresh and clean. No ligaments. And I'll just click on a random bone of the appendicular skeleton, and I'm just going to click upper limb. Uh, so there we can see our upper limbs. And those are what we want to focus on. Uh, first, I'll click on the axial skeleton and just hide that entirely. So here we're focusing on the appendicular skeleton. Uh, first we'll focus on the upper appendages and as we look at the upper appendage or the arm as most people call it we have the clavicle and the shoulder blade or excuse me the collarbone and the shoulder blade in common English or the clavicle and scapula in technical English, uh, terminology to focus on. So let's focus on our scapula first. As we look at the scapula, I'll zoom in on this for us here. We have multiple parts of the scapula that we want you to know. Uh, first, the most notable part of the scapula is this red ridge. This is the scapular spine in bright red. That always pops out at me. Um, as we look at right here, we have this purple appendage right here sticking out. This purple part is called the acromion, and the acromion and the coracoid process right here are palpatable. So if you reach over to your shoulder and start palpating your shoulder, towards the posterior lateral margin of your shoulder is the acromion. The anterior lateral margin of your shoulder is the acromion the coracoid process. And I want to emphasize coid, it's coracoid, not coronoid. The glenoid cavity is right here. It is the indentation that the head of the humerus articulates against. We also have a suprascapular notch. As the name implies, supra meaning superior uh, and sca scapular referring to the scapula and the notch tells you what to look for. So as we're looking for that suprascapular notch, it's, oh, wrong suprascapular notch. It's right there. <laughs> Sorry about that. I got my notches mixed up there for a moment. So on the superior margin of the scapula, right there, by the coracoid process, we have the suprascapular notch. Up next, we have the clavicle. The clavicle also known as the collarbone, uh, is rather simple. We don't have any special features of the clavicle we're going to ask you about. Just know what a clavicle is. So that is the pectoral girdle. Let's move on to the upper limb in particular. We have the humerus, a radius, and ulna as the long bones of the upper limb, or the main long bones. So as you look at the humerus, it is the proximal bone of the upper limb. The humerus has several regions that we need to highlight. Uh, notably, we have the head of the humerus. The head of the humerus is up here in olive green and is the proximal margin. We also have the deltoid tuberosity. The deltoid tuberosity is down here. It's purple pink in this model. This is where the deltoid attaches. It's the insertion of the deltoid muscle onto the humerus. We also have the trochlea and capitulum. The trochlea and capitulum are on the distal margin. So here in orange is our trochlea. This trochlea, I need to zoom out a skosh here, and I need to center. So here's our trochlea, and scroll up. There we go. So there we can see the trochlea pivoting nicely. Um, the trochlea is the most distal part of the humerus. It sticks out the farthest on the distal end. 
and then we also have the capitulum. Our capitulum is right here, the tro and it's going to be lateral. So if we find the head of the humerus, it's medial up here. The trochlea is the most distal and medial portion of the humerus. And then the capitulum is the most distal lateral margin of the humerus. These can be referred to as the condyles of the humerus. And then directly superior to them, we have the epicondyles, medial and lateral epicondyles. I should say directly proximal to them. So right here, we have the medial epicondyle directly proximal, directly above the trochlea. And then if this is our capitulum, right here, this little bump sticking out is the lateral epicondyle. And then we have some fossas. We have the coronoid fossa and the olecranon fossa. The coronoid fossa is anterior, it's the shallower indentation. And then on the posterior, shown here in pink, is a really deep indentation. That deep indentation is the olecranon fossa. And I'm going to back up here and show you that olecranon fossa. So here is the humerus, here is the ulna, and this little process here, this part sticking out is the olecranon process. The olecranon process sit, or the olecranon sits in the, of the ulna, sits in the olecranon fossa of the humerus, hence the name. So we can connect them to each other. So we have the olecranon of the ulna that sits in the olecranon fossa of the humerus. The next bone we're going to cover is the radius. The radius uh, is going to be the lateral bone of the upper limb, the distal upper limb. So here we have the radius. I always think of the radius as being on the thumb side. So, you know, let's get rid of that. Too much cartilage there. There, nice and clean again, nice and fresh. So here's our radius. Here's the thumb, or the three bones of the thumb. So there, as we look at the radius, we're not going to ask many bony markings on the radius, but there are a couple. First, we want you to focus on the head of the radius. The head of the radius uh, oftentimes resembles to many individuals uh, kind of a toadstool or mushroom cap. So here it is in olive green. We also want you to know the radial tuberosity and the radial styloid processes. So as we look at the radial tuberosity, a tuberosity is a rough bump. Here it's shown in yellow. And this is going to be a muscle attachment point. And then we also have a styloid process. The styloid processes of the wrist, um, so there's one on the radius and one on the ulna. So we have radial styloid process, ulnar styloid process. These styloid processes are going to be pointy bones or pointy um, projections from the bone that are on the lateral margin. So here on the radius, it is shown as orange. This is the radial styloid process in orange. And those are the bony markings of the radius that I want you to know for lab. Uh, the next bone is the ulna. Our ulna is going to have a few more bones that we are markings that we need to know. As we look at the ulna, it is right here. It's on the to zoom out. It's always going to be on the pinky side. So here's the that your pinky finger. And then here's the ulna on the pinky side. The ulna is also going to form the hinge joint of the elbow. So let's zoom in on the ulna, ulna and show that in more detail. First, uh, because I just talked about the styloid process of the radius, I want to point out the styloid process of the ulna down here, shown in purple or pink. And then I also want to point out the olecranon here the olecranon is shown in gray. That olecranon of the ulna is what you can palpate. If you feel your palpate your elbow or feel your elbow, uh, that is the point of your elbow that you're feeling, the olecranon. And then here in pink, we have the trochlear notch, which the trochlea of the humerus sits inside of. 
So remember that trochlea of the humerus? That in, sits inside of the trochlear notch. And then the ulna, excuse me, the olecranon, sits inside of the olecranon fossa. And then finally, we have the coronoid process. Our coronoid process, and I want to emphasize N-O-I-D, noid, not coid. The coronoid process here is going to be on the anterior margin of the trochlear notch. And those are the five structures of the ulna that we want you to know. Finally, we're, gonna, we're almost done here. We're wrapping it up. We have bones of the hand. So as we look at the bones of the hand, our hand bones, here we go. Right here is the hand. And as we're looking at our hand, uh, I just added a bunch of ligaments again. Oh, I hate it when I do that. All right, there's our, our ligaments are gone again. So here are the bones of the hands, all, our hand, all highlighted for you. They're broken up into three broad categories. We have these short bones. These short bones right here are all collectively referred to as carpal bones. And then we have the long bones. And the long bones are broken up into two categories. We have the metacarpals, highlighted in teal right here. And then we have the phalanges of the hand. I have all the phalanges of the middle finger, or third digit, highlighted right here. Um, as we look at the carpal bones, most of the carpal bones, we're not going to ask you to memorize. There's one very specific one we want you to memorize, and that's the pisiform. The reason we want you to memorize the pisiform out of all the carpal bones is that it's really important for differentiating left versus right hands. Um, if you take an occupational therapy class, uh, where you need to know the bones of the hands in more detail, uh, or a physical therapy class, I guarantee you'll cover all the carpals, but this is just a general A&P class, so we're not going to cover them in great detail. But right here, this guy that I just highlighted is the pisiform, and the reason the pisiform is important is visible right here. The pisiform is an anterior bump. So if I look at the posterior of the carpals, they're all smooth, but the anterior of the carpals has that pisiform sticking out anteriorly. And you can go ahead and palpate that just by your wrist um, on the um, medial margin of your wrist, so directly beneath your pinky or directly proximal to the pinky. Uh, by the wrist, you can feel a bump on the pinky side of your wrist. That's the pisiform that you're palpating. And the reason the pisiform is important is because we use that to differentiate left versus right uh, for the in-person lab experiences. As we look at the metacarpal bones, they are going to be numbered one, starting at one with the thumb, then two, three, four, and then five with the pinky side. And when we talk about the carpal, metacarpals, it's important that we need to first say left or right, and then we say metacarpal, and then give a Roman numeral for the number. So this right here is left metacarpal number five, and that's going to be consistent with how it's taught in your lab manual. I'm going to be a stickler on this. Uh, for the lab exam, you need to use this exact terminology that we've spelled out on your lab objective sheet, which is exactly how it's matched in your lab manual. One of the reasons why we're being sticklers on this is because this is, uh, we wanna be consistent with the lab manual. And another reason, a uh, very practical reason, is that we want you to learn Roman numerals and how we can use Roman numerals to name body parts. We find that Roman numerals is something are something that students tend to struggle with. As we look at the phalanges, so the finger bones, also known as the toe bones, the phalanges are going to have a similar naming system. We'll have left, right, then they'll be numbered to correspond to the finger. But we also, since there can be up to three phalanges per finger, we need to include proximal and distal and middle. And I want to emphasize middle, not medial. Medial is a directional term that means closer to the midline of the body. Middle means sandwiched in between something. So if I look at the thumb here, we have the proximal phalanx, 
Phalanx is the singular of phalange. Here's the distal phalanx. So I would call this the left distal phalanx number one to be consistent with your lab manual. Or over here, I would call that left middle phalanx number five to use that consistent nomenclature that's spelled out in your lab manual. That's all we have for the upper appendage. If you have any questions or comments on the upper appendage, please feel free to post them on the class discussion boards or shoot me an email. And as always, happy studies.